Good morning. I, I'm Hugh McManus. I'm the director of the Scars of War Foundation at Oxford University. I'd just like to reiterate the previous performance, because that's what it was. Um, I was in the army for 18 years, including the Falklands War, and the, ro the role that the Royal Marine Band played before keeping everybody going in the build-up to the war, during as stretcher bearers, and then afterwards on the way home, playing all the favorite tunes to us as we tried to unwind after our experiences, it was absolutely incredible. And I think it's the most stupid thing in the world where they try to save, save money by cutting military bands and military music. It's unbelievably ridiculous. Yeah. But uh, also, I'm, I am a long time, long serving rock musician, so I do have to say to Guy, thanks very much, mate. Um, a hard act to follow, and here I am trying to wind you up after all that. So we're the Scars of War Foundation. Um, we're looking at the, the cognitive neuroscience, the way the brain is affected by war and disaster. We add the, the disaster bit because a war is a disaster just the same as any other. We are part of Oxford University, and then we, we, we are spreading ourselves outwards to other universities, um, Professor Kringle back in Denmark and we, with, with people at UCLA. We need to spread it out because it's a very new area and everybody needs to cooperate. And the effects of war, sorry, I've slightly got ahead of myself here. My interest in this came actually as a serving soldier, realizing that lots of people I knew were having serious problems afterwards. So I ended up doing a lot of research, and I wrote that book, The Scars of War, which is why we decided to call the foundation uh, what we did. So this, if you like, is how we look at it. You're talking essentially about pain in uh, many different facets, but in fact, if you just think about it as being pain, and then we subdivide pain, then you can see how we look at it and probably about how you in your various perspectives might think of it too. So we've got at the top of this, we've got acute pain, and at the bottom we've got long-term lingering chronic pain. And then on your left-hand side, we've got pain which is invisible, people just suffer it, and then the visible side, which is much easier for everybody to cope with, a chap in a wheelchair, no legs, obviously in pain, he looks like somebody who needs help. The chap who's on the other side, who's suffering pain just the same, but it's invisible, it's difficult to quite see him in the same context. And he is the person, I suppose, primarily that we're looking at. So at the top, when it's acute, let's talk about, first of all, what's visible. A gunshot wound or the pain that you get when you've lost a leg, lost a limb, and then it's not there. Uh, gunshot wounds, high-velocity weapons, create massive shockwaves throughout the body. They, dis they damage the nerve endings over a huge area, and then in time, particularly if it's not um, treated absolutely correctly, but in time anyway, it can turn into intractable pain that can't be relieved by opiates. So that's as it goes chronic, so to the bottom, and we get something like phantom limb pain. Very interesting. You've lost your leg, but your toe still itches. But actually, that's the cuddly way of thinking of it. What happens is you've lost your leg, but your toe still really hurts, and it won't stop, and the drugs don't do any good because you haven't got a toe, you haven't got a leg. So, and then on the other side of things, battle shock, mild traumatic brain injury. Now, the First World War, there was a huge debate as to whether or not, I'm going to pour this over the computer, I'm not careful. The, there was a huge debate as to whether the psychological problems caused by war were, in fact, caused by impact. Explosions or bangs on the head, all of which are endemic on a battlefield, and whether or not stress had a, um, a, a part to play in that. The answer is the symptoms for mild traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder are pretty much the same, very difficult to differentiate between, and uh, the one, if not treated properly, turns into the other. So, it then moves down in time, 
and you get post-traumatic stress disorder a year or more after the event. The average de self-declaring time period is 13 years, but that's because soldiers don't like to admit they have weaknesses. Uh, it, it occurs really according to criteria a, a year or more. And of course, that's why we put alcoholism above PTSD, because self-medication is a fairly standard way of coping with that kind of thing. So what we do, and I'd like to really sort of stress this, is that we do hard science on finding out what is going on. Now, it may well be that you know what is going on in terms of psychology, but what we're trying to find out is the hard science of why these things happen organically. So here's a classic example here of having found out something definite and then doing something, a direct intervention. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to find solutions for PTSD that involve putting electrodes into your brain, like Professor Tipu Aziz, who's one of our team in Oxford, is doing there. But it's the route towards finding things that you can do. So this is where this, we have the largest case series of, of, of using uh, direct deep brain stimulation to control intractable pain. And we've done it on quite a number of soldiers from Afghanistan who would otherwise um, have suffered pain which couldn't be controlled. Uh, with a, facing a whole lifetime of it. It's amazingly effective. So we do this by putting people in very high-tech machines like that, gathering vast amounts of data from their brains and then processing that data in all manner of extremely clever ways um, which are being uh, invented, reinvented, perfected as we go. And that's how we find out what's going on. We're doing uh, currently a neuroimaging um, five-year project with ex-veterans ex um, who've got chronic PTSD comparing people with chronic PTSD with those of similar military experience with no PTSD. And then the next thing we're going to do is a five-year study of, of British veterans before they deploy on an operation and then scanning the same brains a number of times after, over a number of years after, so that we can, have, we can see the progress of the condition as it develops.